Welcome to Act 3, the podcast where we explore how to thoughtfully shape the rest of our lives. I'm your host, Kara Gray. This podcast is sponsored by Good Morning Freedom, my retirement coaching service where I help executives and professionals plan their Act 3. For more information, stay tuned until the end. Hey there, listeners. Before we dive into today's episode, I've got some exciting news to share. We're all about celebrating life's big milestones here. And what's bigger than stepping into the golden years of your retirement? That's why I'm super excited to introduce our exclusive retirement swag collection. Picture this, stylish hoodies, sleek t-shirts, and classic baseball caps, each crafted to embody the spirit of retirement. It's not just about kicking back and relaxing. It's about embracing freedom, stepping into a new phase of being rewired, and thriving in your Act 3. Our collection celebrates these moments with designs that are minimal yet chic, modern yet timeless, perfect for you, or as thoughtful gifts for your retired friends and family. And guess what? Shopping is just a click away. Visit goodmorningfreedom.myshopify.com to explore our range. Each piece tells a story, your story, of a life well lived and a future full of possibilities. Don't forget to check out the show notes for the link as well. But here's the catch. These are exclusive, limited time offerings. So make sure to grab your favorites before they're gone. Celebrate retirement in style with our retirement swag and let the world know that the best is yet to come. And now, on with the show. Today, I welcome Joey Savalaggio to the podcast. Joey enjoyed a distinguished 19-year career as principal oboe with the Memphis Symphony Orchestra. He has also held principal positions with orchestras across North America, including the Brit Festival Orchestra and the Windsor Symphony Orchestra. An accomplished chamber musician, Joey has appeared frequently on CBC Radio and at the International Double Read Conventions. He has inspired new works by leading Canadian composers and premiered concertos with major orchestras. Since 2010, Joey has designed innovative educational programs that use classical music to promote literacy and creativity among young audiences. He recently returned to his hometown of Sudbury, Ontario, to serve as a teaching artist, sharing his passion for music and storytelling with students in the public school system and the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Welcome, Joey, to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Sure. So I like to start at the beginning, not the very beginning, but, you know, beginning of your career. And I want to ask you what originally inspired you to become a professional musician. Well, ever since I was a very, very young person, I was always, uh, I just loved music. I used to steal all the glasses from uh, the kitchen and fill them to different uh, levels with water and tune them to my voice and then learn songs. Wow. Um, and um, so it was always a thing that I was passionate about. I didn't know anything about classical music. I wasn't raised with classical music. So really, my uh, greatest career aspiration as a child was that I might one day become a member of ABBA. Um, so... When I, I heard Dvorak's Ninth Symphony for the first time and in my band class, and, um, and I just fell in love with it. And so I went home, I actually got a cassette tape, and I learned the whole piece from the recording. And I did that with many pieces. Uh, I apparently wasn't much troubled by social obligations as a teenager, um, so I had that kind of time. So, um, and then uh, there was a fluke. I met a teacher um, who uh, saw some... Um, some aptitude, and I had had no no lessons. And three weeks later, I ended up at the Interlochen Arts Academy, where um, I was exposed to my first actual training. And I also saw how much young people could achieve. I'd never seen people my age who had who had accomplished so much in music, and that was that was it. That I knew that that was a thing I wanted to do. Um, going there for my last two years of high school really gave me kind of a leg up, um, and I was able to then I, I went. Uh, sailed through a bunch of schools, um, <laughs> kind of not doing what I was supposed to all the time. And so when somebody would threaten to take my scholarship away, I would audition for another school. And then I would go there. And so, um, and then I just, and then I, I ended up starting to, I, I ended up working eventually. So Nice. So let's talk about that. You did hold a prestigious position in the Memphis Symphony 
for nearly two decades. Um, what were some highlights of your time with the orchestra? Well, you know, the real highlights for me were often um, my experiences off stage. So when I was in Memphis, I was given the opportunity to participate in a lot of their um, uh, programming that happened uh, around their education and their their outreach initiatives. Um, and so uh, I remember my the the what I think might have been the most important um, experience that I had there. I volunteered to engage with this project work where um, the grant writer for Memphis at the time, brilliant person, Rhonda Kazi, she um, got a grant from the Mellon Foundation for this for the symphony to go to this sort of test kitchen. It was it was hosted at Princeton in Princeton and not at Princeton. Um, and so we traveled and spent a week where a bunch of orchestras went with similar funding to develop a new project work that would eventually um, result in different revenue streams for, for their orchestras. And they paired me, so I was the only musician working on this one project uh, with a board member and our conductor. And they paired us with a facilitator named Eric Booth, who I'm sure you know, he's um, a, like sort of the leading writer on teaching artistry um, <clears throat> in North America, amazing guy. And, we were talking one day. I, I was very really shy. I didn't really know why I volunteered to go. I think I just wanted to go on, on a trip, to be honest. But I got there and I started like rampantly contributing to this to this uh, new project, which was a leadership training um, seminar that we were building for FedEx. And um, so Eric one day kind of just nabbed me when I, I was outside of a session. And he said, you know, like, I know you're really into playing right now, but if you wanted to launch your own thing, I believe that you can do that. And I didn't really take it seriously. Um, but when I look back on it now, that was a really pivotal moment for me because it gave me the confidence to start piloting things around town. I, and, and, um, you know, and that's led me to the work today. You are getting to my next question. <laughs> yeah. So that is how you got involved with designing educational programs. Tell me more about the work that you're doing now and what your hopes are you know, five, 10 rest of your life legacy stuff out. Like, let's dream a little bit here. Okay. Um, I love doing that. I, um, <laughs> well, right now <clears throat> I've retired from professional playing. I still play a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but well, you know, it's stressful and you're, you're never good enough in your head. There, there are so many things about being a professional musician that were sort of crazy making. And so <clears throat> what I'm doing now is I'm using music, uh, live classical music, to work with kids to inspire them to write stories. And, um, and then what we do is we record a student narration. I used to do this live, but um, since COVID, I moved it online. <clears throat> um, so we build a story together, um, inspired by music, that students will narrate, do a recorded narration, and then I provide a soundtrack uh, m using the music that uh, inspired the story elements. And then I fill it out a little bit. And, uh, with some other incidental music. And <clears throat> what's really cool though, is that, um, so this is my primary uh, program that I that I work on right now. When I moved back to Canada, I just cold called the Rainbow District School Board and proposed this eight week residency. And and uh, they, had, they have a fantastic arts advocate who was working with the school board who said, yeah, this sounds like a great way to teach. And <clears throat> what's amazing is how much it's evolved because it ends up that, not only can you teach so many things through the use of music, I mean, from numeracy to history, everything ties in. Um, <clears throat> but my passion is to use it to, to engage with language. And like so many things bubble up when you're writing a story that you don't intend necessarily to teach, but are really fun, teachable things like, like alliteration or idioms, um, simple things like rhyming and opposites. These are all things that you can, that you can really drive home with music. And, um, so what I what I realized when I was working on one of these videos, um, a young woman dropped one of her lines, um, a hush fell over the room, and I realized, okay, hang on, like you you get it right, you really got what like what it meant to be reading this a dynamic in a dynamic way, and that's when it occurred to me that comprehension is really the the most powerful thing when it comes to a dynamic delivery of of a, a narrative and. Some of the students were reading kind of flat and I realized, hey, you know, I don't think that we really spent enough time on on really digging into what you are saying. And so then I started to do some coaching about uh, comprehension and how do we deliver lines differently. And um, 
and and I and I what I it's what's fun too is to use music. So as an oboist, uh, obviously there are so many ways that we can as oboists. There are so many ways that we can um, change how we play to influence the mood or how you know how someone is going to hear you. And just really um, obvious things like pause or pace or um, the length of a note. So I'll play lines to them and I have them uh, dictate back to me according to the different styles in which I'm playing. So I'll just play a musical representation of a simple line of dialogue and they will, they'll try to duplicate that with their voice. And so in doing with so- With words. Get, yeah, with words. And so we okay. end up getting to play around with different styles of delivery. Um, so I currently do that work for the school board here, the public board, and um, for the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, which is a really, really fantastic organization. Um, I think right now I might currently be working with five different program leads, um, and and that's nationally. So that work is is uh, is online, and I love that the reach is so great. Um, and then I just um, had a conversation with the local uh, um, CNIB, and we we're thinking that was my belly. Did you hear that? Um, <laughs> I did it. <laughs> um, and um, we're, we're developing some programming that I think I can tie into the, the, the local symphony here. So I'm also currently um, managing the symphony's education and outreach initiatives. So I'm building their materials. And we have a very robust relationship with the library system here. The librarians in this town. Oh, my goodness. You, I've never seen. I don't think I don't know if I've ever had more engaged partners than these librarians. They're practically fighting over who gets to participate which is incredible. That makes me feel pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm building, I build, uh, I'm currently building um, programming for the symphony and, but, but my, my real focus is on this, this literacy program um, that I'm, that I'm leading. So it's like an eight week thing. Um, and I'm looking at expanding next year. I'm looking at some granting um, and maybe something in conjunction with the library that's an independent project from what I'm doing with the symphony. Um, that's a lot. I just gave you a whole lot. That's okay. <laughs> does the, does the program for the public schools differ from the one for the school for the blind? You know, it's interesting. So before I started teaching at the CNIB, um, <clears throat> I did extensive research about how would I have to modify my approach? And, <clears throat> you know, it turns out I don't really have to. Um, the, it, the, the kids that I work with, um, are all, unbelievably all of them are unbelievably creative um what i'm what i but no i mean I, I i was worried that i would not know how to address um different learning styles but what it's what has come to what what i understand now is that um outside of i mean i a couple of visual aids that i use um with the cited uh there's not much there's not much that i have that i change yeah um, what yeah. age are these kids well, okay, so in the school board, I'm teaching at the third grade level. And then with the CNIB, it's a range. So in the summertime, I worked with uh, a group of, I think there were seven to 10 year olds um, doing a story building project with music, but they asked me to incorporate movement. Well, I had no idea how to do that. So I said, absolutely, yes, I will. And, um, <laughs> and then I learned. And, and so, you know, I, I just ended up writing these interactive stories where the kids would perform an action that was described in the story. Um, and then I'm currently working with a group of kids who are, I think they range up to about grade nine or 10, um, about maybe grade eight to 10. Um, and we're building a radio play um, that actually I'm jumping on board to kind of help finish off. It was a project that was ongoing that they brought me on to sort of consult with. Um, yeah. So, but you know, what's amazing about this work is that like I did, um, I've done this with adults. Um, I've done this mm. with university students. Um, I feel like this would be something to do um, with a community of people who are retired. This kind of creativity, the creative aspect of this. So the teaching aspect is one thing when I'm working with kids, because you need to go over concepts of story building, like character and setting and stuff. But with older, um, with older participants, it, it becomes just more of a, a way to engage their creativity and, and, and to use music to do that. So it really has a wide scope of, of people with whom I think it could be helpful or therapeutic or educational. Yeah. I love your story. And I also think you were very fortunate in that one, one career that you retired from transitioned so kind of seamlessly, or was it seamless into this next career? 
Well, it, it just your took third a while, act, shall we say? Yeah, <laughs> it just took a while, is all. So when I started doing this in in Memphis, it was primarily writing and performing children's programming. Then people started to ask me to write for them, other orchestras. So I did something for the Florida Orchestra in Nashville and Tuscaloosa, and um, mm. and you know, so then, and then I we got hired to go to Ireland to 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 twice to do to write and perform a residency in um, Derry, Northern Ireland at the Wald City Music Festival. So slowly I started to build sort of a client base. And then yep. by the time I left Memphis, um, you know, I, I, I had already piloted this, this residency program um, at the very beginning of the work and I'd kind of shelved it. But when I got here, um, I, I'd never been unemployed since I was a young person. I'd always had a job and I purposely, I willfully made myself unemployed by retiring from that job. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, it was it was sort of a, a slow evolution um, to where it's gotten to now. And I've been so lucky because I'm in a small town in northern Ontario right now, but I have never felt so much demand and so much respect for the work that I'm doing. I mean, it is un and it has just blown up in the past year. Um, so um, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. <laughs> And I want to talk about Sudbury. I mean, this is where you grew up. So a lot of times when people retire, they have a big choice to make about where they're going to live and lots of options. I mean, it's an obvious choice to go back to where you came from. But tell me a little bit more about that decision and what drew you back home. Well, and well, I, I looked for some jobs in Canada. I um, interviewed for a teaching position that I got. Um, at an at an El Sistema program, um, and ultimately I felt like it wasn't quite the right fit for me. Um, I wasn't maybe sure I wanted to stop playing entirely at that point. This is maybe mm -hmm. maybe eight or nine years ago, and um, so I, th I moved back here primarily because I wanted to be closer to my family mm -hmm. uh, and to be close to. First of all, this is a beautiful part of the country to live in. Although we did have snow last night. We have snow um, today. It's okay. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> that makes me feel not so bad. Um, <laughs> beautiful place to live. It's a very reasonable uh, uh, place to live. Um, and it's close to other places. I mean, when I got back, I did spend it, uh, the fall semester um, as a teaching artist for the Canadian Opera Company, where I did, I, I helped to, I co-taught an after-school opera program. And that was fascinating. And I, so I, but it was a quick four-hour bus ride to Toronto. So, you know, whatever I can't find here, I, I'm close enough to it somewhere else, you know? Yeah, that's a, that's important when considering location that you can be close to inspiration in a lot of different places and get places easily. So tell us where people can find you if they want to know more about your work and even helping you expand this vision further. Oh, Kara, I don't know how to answer that because I'm in the I'm in the process of just building a website, <laughs> um, and I do have I have a um, I mean I know this is so not businessy of me, but I have a Facebook page right now. The business when I first uh, launched, it was intended that I was going it was going to primarily be a digital uh, storefront for materials for musicians to uh, buy because well, the, again the, the the whole the the idea of this came initially from the fact that. As a musician in an orchestra, you're deployed to go into schools and libraries to play, but uh, but it, it's always just an arts exposure experience, and there's never no one ever gives you meaningful material. You it, like in the industry, you know, you pick something from the Yellow Book, which is a book of woodwind quintets, and you go into the schools and you just put together a program. And so um, I have it, it started initially under the under the name Babu Press, um, B A B U, and I do have a, a Facebook page for that, um, and um, that actually the name came from, I, I used to play an online video game and I used to make fun of the way that Southerners always use the word baby. Oh, come on, baby. And so, but the, the I used to always type it wrong because the Y and the U are very close on the keyboard and I'm a quick typist and a poor proof reader. So that became a sort of a nickname. And um, and so that was sort of how I, I built that because I thought it was goofy. Um, so I it's hard to reach me. <laughs> I'm not making it easy. For <laughs> well, we need to fix that, maybe. <laughs> and like I said, I am in the process of 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 making a very um just sort of simple website, just so that I yeah. can I can you have a landing spot for people. Maybe before you publish this, maybe I can maybe we can amend this part. <laughs> 
We can. We can. And for the listeners, Joey has referenced a couple of times, like, you know, like, you know this, Kara. And it is because we knew each other when we were 18 years old at the Interlochen Arts Academy in a many, many moons ago. And it's so much fun to catch up with Joey and hear about the amazing thing that things that he's doing. So, Joey, I want to thank you so much for your time. And yeah, we'll be in touch to fix up your website for sure. Okay, thanks so much. This podcast is sponsored by Good Morning Freedom, my retirement coaching firm. I help executives and professionals plan the non-financial part of their retirement, like how to discover new purpose and how you want to spend your time. I offer a one-on-one coaching retirement blueprint package where we work together to discover some new avenues of exploration for your Act 3. This coaching is completely custom and will provide you with a ton of resources and support as you transition to this new stage of life. For all the details, please go to goodmorningfreedom.com slash services.